This year we are celebrating the 70th anniversary of the integration of organized baseball, which is spectacular. That is the thing that made everything different. And it happened in Montreal in 1946. The Montreal Royals and the International League became a AAA league, which meant it was just one step down from the major leagues. And Jackie Robinson broke in in 1946. There were very few black citizens in Montreal at the time. When Jackie appeared, he was, he was exotic. And for many of the fans, he would have been maybe the first, or one of the very few black people that they'd ever seen. And so he wasn't a threat, quite the opposite. It was something, you know, magical almost that had come on the scene. An important part of the Jackie Robinson story in Montreal is that he wasn't alone. There were other players in baseball that year who were part of the breaking of the color barrier. When Branch Rickey made the decision to bring Jackie Robinson to Montreal, he realized that, of course, you, you couldn't have Jackie Robinson as the only person of color on the team for all sorts of different reasons, roommates and in spring training. There was another black player from the Negro Leagues there as well, a fellow by the name of Johnny Wright, who was a pitcher and a pretty good pitcher. He got a few outings, but he just wasn't able to manage successfully in the International League. Probably he was under too much pressure. He felt the pressure in a way that uh, perhaps Jackie Robinson didn't, or he dealt with it differently. And in short measure of time, uh, Branch Rickey realized that uh, Johnny Wright wasn't going to survive in Montreal, so he, he shipped him to Trois-Rivières, which had a professional team in a league called the Can-Am League. And he did quite well there. Shortly after Wright left, Branch Rickey tried again with another ball player, Roy Partlow. And Partlow was also a pretty good pitcher. He was a good general ball player. But for whatever the reasons, and I'm not sure it was pressure in the same way as with Johnny Wright, but he wasn't successful. And Jackie Robinson didn't like him. I think it had to do with his off-field demeanor as much as anything. It would start with alcohol and take off from there. In due course, Partlow was sent to Trois-Rivières as well. And he was great. And at the end of the season, Trois-Rivières won the championship, directly as a result of the success that Wright had and that Partlow had. Wright never played integrated baseball again. He went back to the Negro Leagues and he went to ultimately playing in Mexico. Partlow went back and forth. What didn't happen is they didn't stay in organized baseball and they didn't make it to the majors. We've talked about Roy Partlow and we've talked about Johnny Wright. It was also Roy Campanella and Don Newcomb who were with the Nashua team in New Hampshire that year. Eventually Newcomb and Campanella both played in Montreal for the Royals before going on to stardom. And so there were five players who were part of the Dodgers system playing that first year, all contributing to the cracking, breaking, fracturing of the color barrier. What we forget about often is that there was a sixth player who was not part at all of the Dodgers group, but was an independent. He was Manny McIntyre, he was from New Brunswick. He was the first Canadian to break the color barrier in baseball. He's better known by the, the old timers like myself as a hockey player. He played with two other men of color, Ozzie Carnegie and Herbie Carnegie, brothers, and they formed a line for several years they gave themselves names like the Dark Destroyers and they, they played on the fact that they were three players of color who were very good hockey players and the fans loved them. They were an attraction. And in 1946, the Dark Destroyers line had been playing in Sherbrooke and the owner of the Sherbrooke baseball team in the border league knew the man he was a ball player and they signed him to play with the Sherbrooke team. He played shortstop, he batted 300, he did very well, uh, but he decided that it was not the place for him. The schedule was so much more rigorous that he didn't want to become tired or injured and, and miss out on the hockey season. So 
In early July, he played his last game with the Sherbrooke team. The people in Quebec, the people who owned the teams, didn't really have anything against hiring black players, and they wanted to win. And these guys were available. So in a North American climate where blacks were not welcome, and where the barriers were beginning to get broken, where they obviously got broken most readily was in Quebec. Why is the Jackie Robinson story and the people who are connected to the story in Montreal not better known and better celebrated? I do believe it's because it happened in Canada and that the Jackie Robinson story is an American living the American dream. And Canada is an inconvenient part of the story. The question always comes up whether the Jackie Robinson story would have been different had it not happened in Montreal. And I absolutely believe it would have been completely different. It's reasonable for Montrealers to take great pride in this extraordinary event, this turning point, not only in baseball, but in, in the relations of the blacks and whites in North America. The people of Montreal knew they were part of a legend. They were part of history being made. Thank you.